Hello, everyone. Uh, happy Memorial Day to those of you in the States. Remembrance Day to those folks in other countries that celebrate that. Um, celebrating those who, uh, as we vets like to say, never made it out of uniform. So uh, anyway, uh, episode 110 of Kuden. And so here we are. And uh, I know it's a holiday, but I decided to do this anyway, which makes me like, I don't know, dedicated or something. I don't know, but um, it definitely makes me exhausted. <laughs> so anyway, all right. So I'll do my best to not yawn, get sidetracked uh, or anything like that. Right. So anyway, uh, I, I mentioned this last episode for those of you who are following along. Uh, today, we're going to take a look at a couple of terms within the art um, and a little bit of history about how some of these things came to be. Right. And uh really answer the question, right? One, are they the same? Two, how are they different? Those kind of things, right? But first off, right, I was wearing this t-shirt uh, the other night in uh, in class. And uh, oh, yeah, let me turn around here. Can you see this? Okay. okay. So you see the date, right? See the year? One of the, one of the youth students came up behind me and said, uh, Sensei, uh, how old is your t-shirt? And I said, well, how old do you think it is? He said, well, it says 2002 on the back. And I said, and the math is? And he said, your T-shirt's 20 years old. I said, yes. Where were you 20 years ago? Right. And I think he's like, I don't know, 10. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah. So uh, this is one of our uh, our yearly camps. And anyway, still hold up pretty well. But what, what I wanted to point out was like, this was an original uh, logo, one of our original logo from way, way back, right? I don't know if you can see this really, really close for those of you on YouTube and Facebook and all those kind of things. Can you see that, right? So there's this uh, ninja in Doko, right? And behind him is this three-pointed Sanko, right? Uh, Diamond Thunderbolt that represents the Sanmitsu, Triple Secrets of Success, right? Obviously the kanji for Bujin, uh, that kind of stuff, right? So I'm, I'm really big into symbolism and things should, uh, you know, should, should, should speak to our best students, right? The ones who are really looking for what it is that we have to offer, right? But, oh, and it went away. Let me bring this thing back up again. We've got this little overlay, right? So if you look at, up there in the upper, what's well, my upper left-hand corner, hopefully it's yours. The other corner should say Kuden Radio, but the other one says Warrior Concepts. And there's that four-pointed uh, Senban Shudokin with the Nin over it, right? So Here's a quick poll, right? Uh, I don't know how to set up a poll in this thing or whatever, but it'd be really, really cool. You can just kind of type it in and, and let us know. James will keep track of this, right? Uh, and later on, if you're just, if you're watching the recording, you don't always post it in the comments, that kind of thing, right? Uh, if you're on uh, Apple Podcast or Stitcher or one of the audio only ones, sorry, you're not going to be able to play. It doesn't work that way, right? So, um, but the new, the current logo, right, is the well, and we've had it for years right, is the Senban Shudokin with the Nin symbol in the middle of it. The old one, right, is this one here with the Nin, the Sanko behind it. To me, it kind of represented uh, all of the other teachings, right, all the life mastery stuff and power and empowerment and all those kind of things, success teachings and whatnot that that is behind what everybody sees as a martial art, right? The, the ninjas in Doko because we prefer not to fight, right? But we will if we have to. There's this communication, right? And then there's kanji here for the Bujin, right? The divine warrior. Somebody who's part warrior, part spiritual, part, you know, whatever, right? Goes way beyond just being martial arty fighter kind of thing. But anyway, um, we're going to take a little uh, break here to get the intro uh, stuff going and all that. But think about it, right? And uh, it'd be cool to know uh, which one... People think uh, which one speaks to you more, right? Which one is the, I don't know, which one do you, which one speaks to you? Uh, you get the idea, right? Which one do you think is the better one? All right. Uh, just give me a minute and we'll re be right back. Probably won't even take a minute.
So, the big question is this. How are self-defense and success-minded people like us, concerned citizens worried about protecting ourselves, our loved ones, and the things we care about from the monsters we know exist in the world? How do we train in a way that gives us the skills, knowledge, and understanding we need without becoming paranoid fighters or killers ourselves, and yet still allows us to be the hero protector the world needs us to be? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. My name is Jeffrey Miller, and welcome to Kudan Radio, real training for real people in a real world. And we're back. All right, excellent. So, I don't know, James, anybody start typing things in or anything? I see numbers coming up and down with things. That's all right. That's that's okay. Um, maybe people don't have preferences, or maybe they, I don't know, maybe they don't care. Anyway, uh, I just thought it'd be something neat to throw out there uh, for the visual uh, folks on, right? So anyway, um, I'm going to shift in my seat here a little bit so that I stop chopping my head off for those of you watching video, right? So anyway, uh, as most of you know, or many of you know, I have been around in this art since 1980, right? Uh, officially with, uh, I don't know what his rank is anymore, or self-imposed title or whatever, but uh, with Sensei Hayes, right, Stephen Hayes, uh, since 1981 um, and officially started like attaining rank and stuff like that in 86. So I went a couple of years where I really didn't care about rank. Uh, I really, really didn't, right? I mean, I was a, I was a, a military police officer and all I knew is I needed training and a lot of you guys know my backstory and all that. So, um, uh, you may have, uh, you may have already listened to episode 68, which is the whole backstory, the kind of the reboot to the whole uh, thing after we took a, like a, what, about a year and a half, uh, break, uh, between the first iteration where I had one of my black belts, uh, as a partner on, and now I've got a different black belt, but he just, he, he hides in the background. Right. Um, so anyway, um, so, uh, I've, I've, the point is I've seen many different changes that have occurred, uh, in the art. Right. And so one of those big changes, right. Was going from calling everything Togakure Ryu Nijutsu or Togakure Ryu Ninpo, right. Way back in the day, right. And Hatsumi Sensei's Bujinkan was the name of his dojo, right? But we were training in Togakure Ryu Ninpo, Togakure Ryu Ninjutsu, and eight other lesser known Japanese martial traditions or martial arts, right? That's the way it was framed, right? And those were the words right out of Soke's mouth, articles, whatever, right? That's the way it was presented, right? Um, and the unarmed side of the training, right, was called Nimpo Taijutsu, right? Nimpo Taijutsu. Roughly translated as the ninja's natural um, body art or the, nat uh, the ninja's body art, whatever. Real, real simple, right? So, and it was always contrasted with conventional martial arts, right? Um, how was it different? how to present things, right? Um, weapons integration, all that kind of stuff, right? And people were pretty clear about the fact that we were training in Nijutsu. And when I say we're training in Nijutsu, I mean, we did stealth training, we did mind training, we did wellness survival stuff, we did uh, weapons, all kinds of things, right? We did the full gamut of this thing called Nijutsu, right? Nimpo Taijutsu being one aspect, okay? But as typically happens, right? And this is a human being thing across the ages, right? It happens in religions. It happens, it happens culturally, it happens all over the place, right? Where people start to, they either start to ease up on standards and, uh, and they either ease up on limitations or they add limitations, right? Um, or, oh boy, how do I, how do I present this? Well, it just gets fucking easier, right? It's just, or they hear something, right? Or read something or get exposed to something or whatever. It gets majorly mistranslated. And then, uh, I don't know how many other old folks are, are on, the, on the show or whatever, but we used to play a game called Telephone. And what Telephone was, was um, 
somebody was given given a piece of paper or whatever, right? Had something written on it, right? So what they would do is they would everybody would, would be in a circle, right? And so the person who read the card, right? Here's this piece of information, right? What they do is they lean over to the person to the right, left doesn't really matter, right? Lean over to the next person and they whisper in their ear this thing that's on the card. And then that person is supposed to lean over and whisper the same thing into the next person's ear, next person's ear, all the way around until the person to my other side whispers in my ear what's on the card, right? Yeah, no, never happens, okay? And not only does it never happen, what gets whispered in the other ear is like, where the hell did that come from, right? And then what we used to do was figure out where things went amiss. Well, things usually start to go amiss three to four people away from um, the the original uh, presenter, so to speak, right? And then everything just goes to hell in a handbasket, right? Um, and it was a lesson. I mean, it was a game. It was this neat thing that we played, but it was a lesson in how quickly things can deteriorate into shit and become nothing like what was presented. Okay. So here we are, right? 1980, 81, all the way to, oh shit, 89, 90, something like that. Right. Um, the Taikai in Princeton, New Jersey, it was actually on university grounds. Uh, I know this because we almost got asked to never come back because a bunch of this proved Hatsumi Sensei's point during Taikai. Okay, a bunch of people were practicing their ninja skills, climbing up buildings and all kinds of things, right on university grounds, and um, security was called, all kinds of things, right? So. The next morning, an announcement had to be made. Like, are you, you know, are you, what are you nuts, right? So, uh, what ended up happening was, for all that time, right, and even before that, right, because I got I jumped on late, right. Uh, Ninjutsu officially started in the U.S. in '78, I think, something like that, right. So I, I'm two years behind already, right. So anyway, but for that longest time, right, what we were practicing was Nimpo Taijutsu, okay. Well, Taikai comes around this, this year, right? And Hatsumi Sensei introduces everything. And uh, this was right after Manaka Shihan had left the Bujinkan, right? And again, you know, all kinds of crap came around and there became this political bullshit back and forth and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, Tanamuro Sensei, Hatsumi Sensei's cousin, had already left uh, Previous to that, I think that was around eighty six ish, eighty six, eighty seven, something like that, right? That was that was a shit show. That was a fiasco, right? Um, it was a one sided shit show, but either way. And so, we're here at Taikai. We're at, we're in Princeton, New Jersey, and Hatsumi Sensei starts discussing how what Manaka Sensei, what Manaka Shihan was teaching as part of the Jinkan, these basics, these very very critical basics, right? Um, Manakshi had founded his Jinankan around this thing because when he got out of the, uh, the Japanese military, he realized just how crappy Westerners, uh, basics were, right? Of course, that really pissed a bunch of people off because how dare you, right? Critique my stuff when I have this amount of rank, right? Uh, but anyway, that's me since it was talking about how, um, that was really, really important, right? And people do need that, right? So, you know, if you can get some training in that direction, if you can, you know, whatever. Because up to that point, before he left, Nanaka Sensei was Hatsumi Sensei's right-hand man, right? Um, so Hatsumi Sensei was known as Soke. Manaka Shihan was known as Shihan, right? Master teacher. And everybody else then were Shidoshi, Shidoshi Ho and Sensei, you know, that kind of thing, right? So anyway, uh, Hatsumi Sensei was explaining how this was really, really important. This was, you know, now from fifth degree up, people have to pick a side. And that's just the way Japanese tradition works. You have one teacher at a certain point in your training, and that's who you get your information from, right? You are formally a part of a lineage and that that's it, right? It's not that you can't like get other information, but you can't just keep jumping around, right? It, it doesn't work that way, right? You have a teacher, right? So... But he was letting everybody know, look, these things are really, really important, right? If you can get them, 
get them. Just know that my students who are this level, right? Um, I think he said fifth on, right? In today's world, it'd probably be 10th, 15th on or whatever. But um, then, right, if you're here, then you need to, you need to you know, basically pick a side, right? But then what he followed up with was this little incident, right? Or multiple incidents, right? People climbing freaking buildings and, and embarrassing. And they're still, they're, they're still embarrassments, right? For a lot of people, the embarrassments are those who have jumped ship and are no longer with the Bujinkan uh, now that Hatsumi Sensei has passed the torch, right? Uh, but these embarrassments, right, have been going on for, for a long time, right? But anyway, here we are. We're in Princeton. This thing is discussed, right? And Hatsumi Sensei makes the point, right, that a lot of people are getting hurt. They're hurting other people. And the bigger reason is because they misunderstand Ninja 2. They, they don't get it, right? He's been teaching this stuff for a long time. They don't understand it. And the reason they don't understand it, by and large, is because they haven't been studying conventional warrior stuff, right? And Ninjutsu is a variation on conventional warrior training. So you have to understand that first, right? And then he went into the, the Togakure, uh, Togakure school's uh, 18 levels of ninja training, right? The ninja juhake, right? Except that there's actually 36, right? Areas of training. 18 on the Budo side, right? For conventional warriors, and 18 on the ninja side. We have to know conventional stuff before we can make a variation out of it, before you can even understand the variations, right? Before you can beat that stuff, you need to understand it, right? And again, it's too much work for people because, you know, so again, here, here, here's what I like to point out, right? If you think I'm full of shit, then you must by default think Hatsumi Sensei was full of shit because I'm only passing on, I'm, just a messenger, right? So, uh, but what he said was, because all this stuff was going on, for a while, we're not going to do Nijutsu. We're going to focus on Budo Taijutsu, right? Because people need to understand this, right? So we're going to focus on Budo. We're going to focus on Budo Taijutsu. Then, as people get a certain level of proficiency, understanding, and that kind of stuff, then they can approach Nijutsu properly, right? Before that weekend was over, and it started, as far as I know, it started with an interview with some of the senior uh, Western teachers that were there uh, doing an interview with, I think, Black Belt Magazine, but it could have been a different martial arts magazine. There was a, a reporter there. He was doing up an article and all that, right? And so what ended up happening, and again, this is like only a couple of hours, and we're all in the same room, right? So it's not like he told me, I told somebody else, that person told one of these interviewers uh, or, or people you know, doing the interview, right? It didn't even take that long. We were all in the same damn room, right? But what came out of it was we don't do ninjutsu. We do budo taijutsu. And so there goes the train, right, uh, off the track heading somewhere, right? So uh, I have this program, right? Uh, shameless plug, right? I have this program called Ninja no Hachimon, right? It was actually the first online training program uh, I ever taught, I ever did, right? Um, James, when was that? 2008, maybe? No, it was before that, wasn't it? 2000, when the hell was it? It's been around for a long time, right? <laughs> so um well, uh, what's his uh, what's his name? Uh, Carl. Carl's been around for 14, 15 years. Um, so it had to have been that because Carl was in that first program, and then they stayed with me uh, for this for the rest of the stuff, right? So, so yeah, 14, 15 years ago. So what is that? That's before two thousand. Uh, yeah, that's before two thousand eight, right? So anyway, uh, and the whole first module of this 10, I think 10 module program, right, is diving into and looking at what Nijutsu is. Because the, the, well, the whole program is about what Nijutsu is based on a historical model, right, that was uh, used in ancient Japan to determine based on schools and people, teachers, right, who was and who was not allowed to say they were teaching Nijutsu, right? 
and there was this thing called the Ninja no Hachimon, right? Eight gates, right? This is, this is, you know, eight areas of study that had to be taught. Now, I have more of an, I'm going to say it's an updated version, but it's not me throwing whatever shit together, right? It's understanding what's being taught in the original eight, and then what does that look like in today's world, right? So, and my students have to reconcile between the two of them. They have, they have to learn all of it anyway, right? So, but... The, the premise of it was, if we're going to be doing this stuff, or we're, we, we're going to be doing this thing that we say we're doing, we think we're doing, or whatever, we should probably know what the hell we're talking about. We should probably know what is involved, right? Because otherwise, people just make shit up, right? As you probably haven't been able to tell with all the ninja this and ninja that groups and whatever going on, right? So, anyway, so... Um, just, I, I thought during this episode, what we do is kind of take a look at a couple of these little lessons. And if you're interested in going through the whole course or whatever, we can, uh, put out a, a link or something, or you can just, well, there's the, there's the URL there, the lower right hand corner for online Ninja Academy. That's where you can find it as well as Ninja Mind and a whole bunch of other programs. But anyway, um, what we do is take a look at one of these lessons, which is really breaking things down, right? And one of my favorite things to do when I'm teaching and Hans Mitzvah takes pointed this stuff out as well. So about several of the other master teachers, right? We are trying to learn a uniquely Japanese approach to lessons that came through China, all the way back through the Silk Road, all the way back into India, that kind of stuff, right? And of course, things were added to, adapted, all that kind of stuff based on, uh, you know, the size, armor, uh, weapons, other types of considerations and stuff, right? But the essential nature of the techniques, the essential nature of the training didn't change. But what can happen, though, is to go from an Asian perspective on not only warfare, but life and life as a human being and all these kind of th stuff, right? And, and just dropping that into a Western culture that in some instances is very different right? It's very backwards. So um, you're not just trying to translate an Asian way of thinking into a Western way of thinking, but you're also trying to use Western reference points, 20th, 21st century reference points to translate stuff that modern Japanese or Chinese people have a hard time relating to because we're going back several centuries, right? The language is different. The, the way you're referring to things, all that stuff is different, right? So one of my favorite things to do is to start with looking at the kanji that were chosen to, to present what's being presented, right? So uh, again, you know, if we look at Budo Tajitsu, we look at Ninpo Tajitsu, right? Are they really that different, right? And the answer is it depends, okay? Depends on what it is that we're talking about, okay? So uh, you might have to go back and look at the original slide that I put up because I have both the, the, uh, the kanji for budo and the kanji for nimpo on that slide, right? Of course, there's me in this pensive look kind of thing, right? Being really, you know, thoughtful. Right? Anyway, right? So they're there, or you can just do a Google search. Just make sure that when you find, when you look up Ninpo, you don't find Ninjutsu or Ninja. It's the end piece that's going to make the difference, right? So uh, anyway, right? So if, if we start looking at things and start breaking things down, because remember, by and large, kanji, right? Japanese, Chinese, right? Um, kanji are for, for us in the West, right? The best way to describe them is very much like uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, right? They're pictures that represent or point to uh, a, an object, uh, a concept, whatever, right? Like um, uh, discipline, right? Discipline has a person standing on top of a box, right? And then that's next to a secondary kanji that uh, is child, right? And what that is painting a picture of is I'm sorry, I take that back. That's parenting. That's uh, parent, kanji for parent. The kanji for child, or uh, let me back this up. Kanji for discipline. There we go. Discipline, right? One kanji, there's two kanji side by side. One is for, one is the kanji for beautiful, and one's the kanji for child, right? So discipline, beautiful child, 
Well, the whole concept behind that is a disciplined child is a beautiful child, right? So if we start to look into these things, sometimes you get kanji that were kind of created later on and they're not the same thing, right? Um, but by and large, you know, you're, you're looking at a picture, right? And, and you need to understand what's happening. It's kind of like the, the kanji ichimonji or the kama ichimonji, right? Ichimonji. Ichi, right, is this straight line. So for those of you watching on the, on the, on the video, right, it's just a straight line, right? Okay, and then monji, right, the character from monji means character. It means how you write something, okay? So here's this thing, right? So everybody goes, well, ichi, it's one, right? It's just, it's the word one, right? Ichi, you know, ichi, ni, san, si, go, roku, shichi, hachi, you know, one, right? Yeah, but what's it a picture of? Okay, what's it a picture of? Right. It's a picture of the ground, right? So in the in the generic kamai ichimonji, right? And you'll find this in all Hatsumi Sensei's earliest writings uh, that were translated into English. Need to do history and tradition, those kind of things, right? So this is how we introduce things to our beginners because the books that we're referencing, those are the terms that they're using, right? So here's this, right? Ichimonji, right? Just kind of a generic, right? I know there's little changes and whatnot, depending on which lineage, which lineage we're talking about, right? Uh, are we talking about, you know, is it Ichimonji or is it, is it Kukishinden Katatehichi no Kamae? Is it, uh, is it Kotori Sega no Kamae? Look, just a generic Ichimonji kind of thing because we're, we're with our, with our body, with our arm, we're making an Ichi, a number one, right? Hachimonji, we're making a character eight. Jumonji, we're making a character 10, that kind of thing, right? But we have to get past that, right? Because if we get to Gyoko school, Gyoko has an Ichimonji, but it's not a figure one, right? It's kind of different, right? But if we don't understand that the name of the kanji or the name of the kamai is pointing us to the picture, right? The kanji of Ichi, right? Then we're missing a whole lot. Because the picture, right, this line for Ichi is a picture of the ground. And there are lots of multiple, uh, uh, there are other translations for this kanji or, and what they would translate into English, right? Foundation, base, uh, fundamentals, that kind of thing, right? It's pointing to something that if this is shoddy, if this is crap, anything built onto, on it, Right? Anything that comes out of it is going to be crap. It's going to be flawed. It's going to be broken. Right? We combine that with things that Asimi Sensei has taught along the way that if one cannot do Ichimonji no Kamai, one cannot do Taijutsu. And if one cannot do Yokoruki, sideways walking, Ichimonji walking, right? In Kotoryu, it's called Kaniyuki, right? Crab walking, right? If they can't do that, then they can't do Henka. But, you know. Who, who, who wants to study? I mean, come on, seriously, right? I mean, you know, just show me where to put my damn feet and my hands and show me the moves. And that way I can ape the moves and feel like I'm all that in a bag of whatever, toasted shit. Anyway, so, um, but again, there are these, these weird, you know, mistranslations of things, right? So, Let's look at, let's look at the, we'll, we'll, we'll just throw a term in here, right? Budo Tajitsu, right? Well, first of all, we have to start with Budo, right? Budo, right? So the kanji for Bu, right? Um, I probably should bring up a whiteboard, but most of this stuff is going out to, to audible kind of places. And I don't want, I don't want you guys to feel like odd. You can just Google the Japanese kanji, right? Just type in Bu or Budo, right? Budo kanji. Make sure you're in Google Images, otherwise you get a whole bunch of other stuff that pops up, right? So here you have this kanji, right? And a lot of people are very familiar with it, right? It's on patches. It's all over the place in the martial arts, right? So what does this mean, right? Well, bu, right? Also pronounced mu, right? But not the same mu as in empty or lacking or without, right? It's very different, right? So bu or mu, right? It means martial. Right? Warfare. It implies warfare, right? Martial, right? Dole ways, okay? Martial ways, right? So, taijutsu, right? Tai, the kanji for 
uh, tie his body due to art or skills. Okay. So Budo Taijutsu, body skills for martial ways, right? So here's something that I was taught way back when I was a white belt, right? Everybody who does physical things with their body has a form of Taijutsu. This is not something that is owned by the Bujinkan. It is not something that is owned by our nine lineages. It is a general term, Taijutsu, body skills. Right? An American football player has a certain type of Taijutsu, right? A, a soccer player, right? Everybody but American football, right? Okay. They have a certain type of Taijutsu. Ballet dancers have a certain type of uh, Taijutsu that's very different than hip hop dancers, right? It's, it, it's, it points to the skills for this category, right? Ballet, Taijutsu, football, Taijutsu, bowling, Taijutsu, right? Whatever, right? Okay. So here's this thing, right? So, but let's go back to the beginning, right? Budo, martial ways. The skills are going to be for what? Combat, right? Personal protection, battlefield warfare, whatever, okay? Great. Off to a good start, okay? Bujutsu. Jutsu, art, skills, whatever, okay? So skills, warfare, right? You get the idea, right? I mean, we could really dive into the whole boo thing. It can be a whole friggin' episode just out of boo because you can tear the boo kanji apart because it's made up of two separate kanji that I was taught point to the actual job of a warrior, okay? We don't have time, right? But there's always the Ninja Nahatsuma program, right? Anyways, <laughs> anyway, so, uh, okay, so Budo Taijutsu, right? So we get Taijutsu, right? Body skills, okay? If somebody's a freaking carpenter, right? They, they've got certain body skills, right? If somebody is a crane operator, they've got certain body skills, right? Uh, race car driver, uh, you know, um, bike rider. What, I don't care if it's trick riding or whatever, right? Taijutsu is just a general term, right? Budo. Okay, that's what's important here, right? Martial ways. Okay, yes. Ninpo Tajutsu. Tajutsu doesn't change, right? We've already covered that. Ninpo, nin, the kanji for nin. If you don't know what that looks like, upper left hand corner, it's the white squiggly thing on top of the four point, the red four pointed star, right? So nin, right? Uh, that's the Japanese pronunciation of the the original Chinese nin. Okay, if we're Using the Japanese word for that kanji, right, which is not based on Chinese, it's a Japanese overlay. Now we're looking at shinobu, which is where the term shinobi comes from, right? But it's not that, it's ni, okay? This is important. Translating these things correctly is important. Otherwise, we're barking up the wrong freaking tree, okay? So ni. Nin means to persevere, to endure, to overcome challenges. In some cases, to be patient because we cannot act in the moment. Right? Pol is a Japanese transliteration of the word whole. Okay? H O. The, the kanji that you're looking at is the kanji for whole, not pole. It becomes pole, right? Because uh, Nin ends with a hard consonant, right? Ends with an N sound, right? And so the next word, the next part, it would be difficult for Japanese uh, speakers linguistically. So it changes from uh, nin po, nin po to nin po, right? It's easier for us because we speak at the front of our mouths, right? But, uh, and it actually would be more pronounced more like an N-I-M-P-O, nin po, right? Nin po, right? So, uh, but it doesn't change, right? And again, you've got two, two kanji, right, that come together. The kanji for blade, more, more specifically, the working edge of the blade. There's a little extra slash on there that's different from the kanji for pole, right, blade, right, or ken, right? So it's over top, right, of the kanji for shin, kokoro, your heart, right, your core, your essential nature, right? And so 
it means perseverance, right? It means endurance. It means the ability to, to um, be patient in the face of hardship, right? So uh, one, of the, one of the perspectives I was given was, even though the enemy holds his blade at my heart, or I was also told that Chinese look at it even more in depth, even though the enemy's blade is in my heart, right? They're inflicting pain. They're inflicting damage, right? I will endure. I will persevere. I will survive, right? So here's this thing, right? And then whole, pole, right, means law, okay? Law, which points to universal law, or in Buddhism, dharma, truth, okay? Nature, universal law, that kind of thing, right? So what we're looking at is the, the ultimate or, or universal nature of perseverance, enduring, overcoming, surviving, those kind of things, right? So we have that, Nimpo, Taijutsu, right? So does that mean that, well, how do they go together? Well, ultimately, right, warriorship is warriorship, right? So, of course, Budo is there, okay? Because one part of challenging, enduring, and surviving is against actual physical danger, right? Being attacked, right? The physical conflict, right? But is that it? Okay. Is that it? Right. And I, I know I've mentioned this over and over again in different uh, episodes uh, where uh, Hatsumi Sensei shared, and, and this is not me making stuff up. You can look it up in his books, videos, and all that. It shows up again and again where he talks about when he first met Hats uh, Takamatsu Sensei. Right. And oh, he was just this, you know, this guy that had all this, you know, all these black belts or Minkyo Kaiden and how many different martial arts and all that. And Takamasa Sensei, he's just trying to impress this guy. He wants to be his teacher. And Takamasa Sensei says, yeah, I, okay, but can you survive? Survive what? I don't know. Whatever comes up, can you survive? Okay. The point is, this is not just all about physical conflict. Okay? Broken hearts. Uh, people trying to stab you in the back. Right? Family members. Right? Out to undermine you. Uh, whatever right? Whatever, right? Sickness, old age, health, life, right? Can you survive? Can you endure? Or will you just turn into a sniveling, whining, pissing, bitchy little wimp, right? But when everything's going well, right, then we can walk around with a chest puffed out. We can be all that in a bag of microwave popcorn. But, you know, when things don't go our way, then the next thing you know, we're blaming other people. We're attacking people. We're crying in a corner, pissing ourselves to sleep, whatever it is, right? Can you survive? Can you endure, right? And so there's a lot more to ninpo taijutsu, breathing methods, what, what else, right? Relaxation, right? Things for enduring life, health. Uh, that's where the amatsu tatara and, and, and health kind of things come in and all that, right? Okay. Uh, just basic walking is a ninpo taijutsu skill. Walking. Ninja aruki. Right? Because ground surface changes. Things, things change, right? The way we walk and carry ourselves. It's not just about tripping and being able to do break falls and rolls and fancy cool ninja moves, right? The way we walk and our basic posture affects our joints, affects our spine, affects our neck, affects our brain, right? Everything, right? And all of these things are included. It's not just about the warfare. Is the warfare there? Yes, of course, right? But Nippo Tajutsu, when we're looking at the Budo side, is very often the same skills, but how it's done, how it's applied, when, where, how, the timing, all those kind of things, everything changes. Everything changes, right? Nippo Taijutsu, at its very core, has something called Kyojutsu Tenkan, right? The juxtapositioning of truth and falsehood. What that means in basic English is nothing is ever what it looks like. Because if what you're doing is, is what it looks like, he'll defend against it. Consciously, subconsciously, flinch re uh, re response or whatever, right? So... It's not the same. 
Does it have some of the same elements? Yes, of course. But is it the same? Okay. There's, it's not the same in that there's a lot more to it, right? And then that leads to need to, right? Need to, right? The art or skills for enduring surviving, of which nimpo taijutsu is only one aspect. Pretty funny, yeah? Okay. Somehow from 1989 or 1990 to now, nijutsu, people still call it nijutsu. I practice nijutsu. Do you really? Okay. I practice nijutsu. No. You may be practicing nimpo taijutsu, maybe with some extra weapons thrown in. Okay. But more than likely, you're practicing budo taijutsu, which is indirectly a part of nijutsu. Right? Nijutsu itself doesn't even require combat skills. That really irritates people that need to be the guy, right? You can be the guy, right? But if other people need to know that you're the one who did or produced the results that made the difference, that's not Nijutsu. It's not not a hero. It's not not, you know, you didn't not do this thing, right? But Nijutsu understand that in some instances... Nobody needs, needs to know that I did that, okay? Because now all attention's on me, okay? I don't know. I can't work my will with that action. There's all this stuff that goes along with needed to, right? But it's skills for, so tied to, yeah, okay, right? I might need to do some things to help me survive because what's going on is physical in nature and requires me to physically act, right? But what about all the other aspects of needed to that are mind, emotional, uh, uh, spiritual in nature, life uh, that has to do with uh, parenting or being financially successful or all this stuff that got passed on, right? Um, is being healthy and not having your freaking body fall apart. I mean, it's going to anyway, it's just the way things work, right? Um, I just read something in some scientific journal not too long ago because I have weird hobbies, right? That talks about the number of mutations that your body has every day or every year, right? And how they get, the, the more and more of those mutations happen, the older you get, right? Interesting. Anyway, to me, right? But anyway, right? So very different things, right? Very different things. Are they related? Yes, of course, right? But the trick in needed to is if, and this is, this was, I'd like to say beaten into me, but probably physically, mentally, all that stuff, right? If he knows what you're doing, if they can see what you're doing, they can understand it when you're doing it. If they can catch it in the moment you're doing it, it's not needed to. Okay? Way too many people are throwing around words that they have no freaking idea about. Right? Can you use the words? Yeah, of course. You can do whatever you want. Right? I've I've got a, a, a step kid uh, along the way who was always confusing words. Right. Right? We had great laughter around the dinner table because one of those mistakes was calling her sternum a scrotum. So you can use the words. Probably not going to communicate really well with a doctor should you need the, the right word, right? Doctor, my scrotum hurts. Well, one, you ain't a guy. And two, they're going to be looking... <laughs> in the wrong place, right? So um, we need to be careful, right? So uh, again, th these things are flying around. It's it's my responsibility, right? As Daishihan, former Shihan, Shidoshi, blah, 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 right? It's my responsibility to make sure that my students can correctly, not, not only is it my responsibility to pass on the art correctly, but to make sure that my students understand what it is that they, what they're doing. I mean, this is hard enough in the dojo, right? My Shinobi Kai people know this, right? My my long distance people know this, right? You can watch something from four different directions in the dojo and still not see what it is that you're supposed to see, right? It's hard enough for us to get it because, you know, your number one goal, if you're practicing Ninjutsu, your number one goal, or Ninpo Taijutsu, is to be able to trick your training partner, the person who knows what you're doing. You're both working on the same technique. They know the technique. They know what's coming next. 
but your goal is to trick them. And I don't mean doing something outside of the technique. I mean, working the technique, but you catch them. If you can catch them, if you can catch the person who knows what you're doing. Nobody else stands a chance. Okay. This is not just about fighting skills. This is not just about, you know, uh, beating people up and, and winning and all that kind of stuff. Right. Okay. Because if it is, you're going to be really, really confused when we get to the upper levels where we start talking about things like you don't have to win, just don't lose, which really starts to bake people's noodle, right? Or we start talking about, um, you know, drop your, your need to win or your fear of losing. It'll be those things that cause your demise, those kind of things, right? Um, because everybody's wrapped around this like it's a freaking sport martial art, right? Like you're going home with some kind of trophy. You are. Right? It's called your life. Right? If you need something other than that as your trophy and testament of doing things well, see, that leads to a whole other area where our Nimpo uh, uh, Mikyo comes in. Right? Anyway. Sorry about that for you, those of you watching. James, let's fire you up at the moment. Um, I know that was real quick and down and dirty, but I just had a recent conversation with uh, somebody that reached out from me to connect. Uh, they're actually from India. I'm not going to go into their details or anything like that, but I do want to read a little bit of a thread of our communication back and forth because, again, now, I, there's a lot of forgiveness on my part going out to this individual with their conversation because – I understand that they're coming from a conventional martial arts perspective, but I think it's important to help to highlight the differences between what we would call Budo and Ninpo, Kaijutu, and this, this conversation that he and I had, right, should help to highlight some of these differences, right, especially the, the thing that comes at the end, right? Uh, unfortunately, I had to, like, cut off our conversation today because it's a holiday and I was trying to do things with family and whatnot. And as much as people think I should be available 24 um, seven because they're used to Amazon shipping out shit the same day, uh, doesn't work that way. Right. Okay. So people want to do things traditionally, but they want a teacher to be around like they're a drive up window. Yeah. Cause if you want to do things traditionally, you should probably move into your teacher, go to work, make the money, bring it home, do all the cleaning, do all the cooking and all that kind of stuff and be grateful when your teacher passes on a lesson. So that frees up your teacher to do whatever. But see, people don't want to be that traditional because, well, you know, what kind of fun is that? Not about fun. It's about getting the damn lessons. So how traditional, whenever somebody, James knows this, I use this all the time. When somebody says they only want to do things a traditional way, I ask, really, how traditional you want to get there, Bubba? Or Susie Q or whatever, right? So, because it goes deeper than that too, right? <laughs> Anyway, uh, who's on? Were there any questions, comments, complaints? Uh, just one comment. Old Ways Trainings said, someone once told me the two were basically the same. I'm glad there is a difference because I never liked that simplistic way of thinking when it came to those two. Yeah. And I, hmm, they're basically the same. That sounds like somebody who didn't know what the hell they were talking about. Okay. Because even back when we first started and before the term Budo Tajutsu was injected at that uh, at that Taikai at Princeton, um, we were all very, very clear about how and why this was different. As a matter of fact, to reinforce the differences in the early days, that's why Hatsumi Sensei and Stephen Hayes and, and all these guys, right? Um, now in Japan, training in a black uniform, you know, black gi and all that kind of stuff, tabi, that kind of stuff, right? But in the West... There was this decision to dress in like military camo type uniforms, right? So you would often see us in in um, military, like the woodland camo pattern or uh, urban camouflage. If you know what that is, that's the black, the all black uh, stuff. Or uh, there was a gray. It was like the urban, uh, the the woodland pattern, but it was uh, shades of uh, uh, black, white, and grays, right? That kind of thing. But uh, we we also wore black. Uh, the belts, right? We only had three belt colors, right? Because we wanted to focus on who's a beginner and just learning the art, who's in the intermediate phases, and who's in the advanced phases, right? 
And we wore typically, I mean, people could wear a, um, a martial arts belt, but most of us wore military web belts, those utility web belts from the um, 60s, 70s, 80s, that kind of thing, right? So white was for people that were in the beginning stages of the training. Green covered nine Q levels, right? All the intermediate stuff. So people would stop fixating on what their head their next belt was and focus on collecting the tools necessary to understand and operate in the advanced levels. And then no matter how many belt black belt levels we had, people wore black because that at a glance you could see who was who was working at certain levels <coughs> and, and doing what they needed to be doing, right? But there was this concerted effort to differentiate that what we're doing is not the same as every other conventional martial art out there, and we're not playing the style game, right? But again, as soon as people start thinking about style, everything changes. Ninjutsu doesn't have a style, right? It's, it's not the same, right? Well, how would a ninja, you know, take on the, the mafia? Well, it's not because it's not by drawing a freaking sword and running through their base camp and taking on Uzis with a sword, right? I'm either going to go and and you know cower down and and but I'm going to explain things in a way. That's me since I did this with the Yakuza boss once. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Anyway, um, and I'm going to present things in a way like you are uber powerful. You can do whatever you want. However, you might want to consider these things here. And it's not like I'm the one he has to worry about, right? To sway their decision making, right? This is Budo. Ninpo, <laughs> it's very different, right? The approach is very different, right? Um, but anyway, right? So yeah, there, there, there are lots of elements that are the same, right? The big litmus test for everybody at the moment is, one, you have to learn the Budo stuff first. So um, in that respect, sure, they're the same because you have to learn Onikudaki and Ichimoji no Kata and all that, right? That's Budo. But can you do these things in a way that he can't escape them? Okay? He can't see them happening. As a matter of fact, he thinks that something completely different from the technique you're doing is happening, so when he races over there to defend against the thing he thinks is happening, he leaves himself wide open for the thing you're doing. And he never sees the thing that you're doing happening in the moment you do it. That's Ninpo. So you can be doing Ichimoji no Kata in both sides. In one, looks like what it is. In the other, everybody on the outside can see what you're doing, but the guy in the bubble, nope. Okay. And then if you really want to expand things out, the advanced, upper advanced level people, because I have things broken into five different phases, right? The upper advanced level people should be able to even sway the thinking or disguise what they're doing in the eyes of onlookers as well. They shouldn't be able to tell either. Okay? It's very, very different. Very different. Okay? But you have to understand Nijutsu, you have to understand Ninpo, you have to understand the thinking, right? This is not about difference in physical techniques. This goes to our very core. It's a different perspective. It's a different way of thinking. It's a different way of planning. Even if the actions look the same, okay? We're not doing things because, like, this is Nijutsu. We're not doing things because, you know, this is Bujinkan and this is our style. Right? As a matter of fact, in, in Isuke Sensei's dojo, um, if you make a mistake, right, if you keep screwing something basic up or whatever, right, some of the seniors will come over and after they finish laughing at you, right, especially like if you, if, if you, I'm just letting some of my guys know, if you're one of my students, right, I have taught you the correct way to do things. If you go to Japan, you're not doing it that way, okay, and this has happened in the past, well, they'll laugh and go, well, who's your teacher? And they'll go, they'll point at me and they'll go, we were just asking, we know who your teacher is. So how is it he's doing it right? But you, and then they'll laugh again and they'll go, okay, this is your style. And they'll imitate this person's thing. And they'll go, no, no, it's like this. And they'll show the right way, right? But your style, right? 
So it's not one martial art over another style, this art style, that art style, right? It's your style of movement, right? How in tune with natural law or natural human physiological power, movement, those kind of things, are you? Or do you have your own style? Well, I'd like to have my own style. Well, then everybody's going to know it was you, right? One of the reasons why we learn how to do ninja aruki, ninja walking, right, is not just so that we save our spine and our brain and all that kind of stuff, right? But it's because you change how you, you move. You, you're not just saving energy and all that kind of stuff, right? Our brain recognizes a friend, somebody that we know, friend or family member that we've known for a while, across a parking lot before you can actually see the details and know that and, and recognize facial features and stuff like that. Did you know that? Okay. Did you ever look across a room or a, you know, a, a field or whatever and swear to God that you see your friend and you yell, Bob, Bob, right? And you, the guy's not paying attention, right? So you yell, yell louder, right? And you might even start moving toward them, right? Hey, I'm talking to you, Bob, right? And then next thing you know, the guy turns around and you go, well, shit, you're not Bob. So, sorry, man. I thought you were somebody that I know, right? Happens all the time, right? And it's because your brain recognized familiar features. It's like when we read things, right? After, after you develop a, a level of proficiency with, with reading and, and things like that, right? Your brain only looks at the first and last letter of a word. You can scramble the letters in the middle, right? And as long as the basic structure is there, your brain will recognize the word. Okay. Now, you can really screw it up by doing words that are really close to each other, right? Like level and lever, right? <laughs> you can screw things up a little bit, right? But it, it starts to take shortcuts, which is one of the things we as ninja take advantage of, okay? So, but you, you, start, to, you start to change that, right? You, you, become, you become more ghost-like, right? You become more more free and all that, right? But, and here's the other thing too, with your Nimpo Taijutsu, right? With your Ninja Aruki, Nimpo Taijutsu, whatever, right? What I have, what I have learned over the years is that the better your Taijutsu, the easier it is for you to copy someone else's style. I don't care if it's somebody who's injured and limping along or somebody who's doing a different martial art from you. And with minor, the need for minor correction on details, you can jump right in and duplicate their stuff. But, however, right, it's very difficult for people that are indoctrinated and ingrained in a specific style of movement to move as freely as we're supposed to move. It's almost impossible for them to copy it. It's really, really difficult. And I've seen this in seminar after seminar after seminar where people just get really, really frustrated or they, they think that they're doing what, they're, what we're doing, right? But they don't understand. They don't realize how that start-stop um, robotic, I, I call it robotic, right? Start-stop, no matter how fast they go, that, that, you know, there's a certain timing, there's a certain rhythm, there's a certain, you know, muscular dynamic and things like that going on that as long as the other person plays pretty much the same game, right, things work out okay, right? It's when the other person is doing things very, very differently, right? But this isn't just a ninja thing, right? The reason Chuck Norris, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step on sacred land here, right? Because, you know, Chuck Norris is the invincible god, right? So... But the reason Chuck Norris won all of his all of his uh, tournaments in the beginning was because he went up against Japanese stylists, and his Taekwondo Tangsudo was very different. Right? You know, he retired after the the, the last fight he had um, was the last fight he had because he went up against another Korean stylist, and he wasn't. He lost, right? So he was winning as long as he, what he was doing was different from what they're doing, okay? So here's this weird thing, 
right? Ninjutsu, to, we're supposed to be atypical. But everybody over the years, not everybody, there's a small percentage of us, right? Has conformed. The nonconformist art has been taken over by people who need conformity. This doesn't mean that you do whatever you want. That's what he says, address this in his books and his videos. Shit, you can look it up on and watch, just watch enough YouTube videos. You'll hear, instead of watching these videos for the entertainment or to learn techniques, turn off your screen, just have audio or maybe just close your eyes or whatever and listen to the techniques he's orally transmitting, not the physical techniques that, because everybody fantasizes about being that indestructible warrior. Now, you're going to be an indestructible warrior. You better know more than physical techniques because this body breaks. Okay? So how do you control the bubble? How do you control the situation? Right? When we, when we control them, right? When most people think of control, again, right? Again, this is, again, we're taking something Asian and we're going to try to translate it from a, from a, a Western perspective, right? But hell, even remember most Japanese didn't think and don't think like a ninja, right? So, well, how the hell is that supposed to work? Right? So, but here's, here's a simple, for instance, right? When most people think of control, right? When we say a ninja controls his attacker's um, decisions, right? Or takes control of the fight long before the attacker ever realizes that he lost it. That was one of my very first lessons as a white belt. Okay. Not Sanchi no Kata, not Ichimonji no Kata, not, okay. as a matter of fact, back in the day, Hatsumi Sensei didn't even teach names and we were not taught that there were scrolls and Kata on the scrolls. Here are the principles and concepts, which is why my, my school, my thing that I'm building, right? It's called warrior concepts, right? It's not about the style, but anyway, right? Most people, when they think of control, they think of some kind of force overt or implied. I'm going to get this guy to do what I want. I'm going to manipulate him. I'm going to trick him. I'm going to, and well, all those there are true, right? They're just not done the way most people have been taught that those things happen. You want to control somebody, what you need to control is their perception of what's real, perception of what's happening in the moment, because their perception, their belief, their viewpoint, whatever, right, determines their thoughts, their words, their plans, their actions, and the outcomes those things produce. You want to control somebody, stop trying to overtly, because if you do it the way most people do it, the other person has to be paying attention. They have to think the same way you're trying to communicate. It's just, it just, and, and then what if they don't? Well, then you've been found out and now you got a big old fucking problem, right? So this is not, the art itself is not what it looks like. It's not just that Nijitsu is teaching you that, look, uh, in Nijitsu, things are not what they, what, what they look like. Well, you know what? Nijitsu is not what it looks like, right? And that's why Hatsumi Sensei has always said over the years, you need to find a Shidoshi or a Shihan, and now it's a Dai Shihan, whatever, who can translate the lessons, who can give you the tools that you need to understand what I'm doing. What do people do? They just go to Hatsumi Sensei's class. Or they just focus on the physical combat, right? Which is all great. But how many times this week have you been physically attacked by somebody? How many times were you in an argument? How many times did somebody try to control you, manipulate you, irritate you, right? How many times did somebody, uh, you know, I don't care if it was your teenager who, uh, you know, circumvented the rule system or whatever to try to get away with something or somebody at work or the pushy salesman or the advertising on TV or oh, wait, you guys don't have TVs anymore. How about the advertising between YouTube videos, right? Where they're trying to control and manipulate how you think about something and they already know how you think. So every time you see a commercial or one of these ads, 
and you go, well, that's stupid. Who would buy that? They're not talking to you. Okay. Every time you see one and you go, oh, that's, that's shit. That's cool. And you start to reach for a freaking credit card. They already knew who they were speaking to. They already know who, who their primary customer was. Right. They don't just throw shit out there. It's too expensive. Right. We're being, there's a control, there's an attempt to control at every turn. Same thing with all this political bullshit that's going on or social re-engineering and all that kind of crap, right? So, anyway. But if we're just going to Budo and Ninpo Taijutsu, please do me a favor and stop saying you're doing Ninjutsu. And I, I really get offended when people say they're doing Bujinkan. Bujinkan is the name of the organization, which is what threw most people off when Hatsumi Sensei broke up Soke ship and gave nine schools to eight people. <gasps> but, but 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 there should be a Soke of the Bujinkan. Really? He inherited the Bujinkan from Takamatsu Sensei? Nope. Takamatsu Sensei's dojo name was something completely different. And the beginning, Hatsumi Sensei, his dojo, right? Bujinkan. Hall of the Divine Warrior. Or Hall of the Divine Warrior Spirit, right? But even before he became Soke, and he was teaching, right? And uh, before he formed uh, loosely a curriculum, right? Um, what he was teaching, what he was passing on, was called Hatsumiha, right? Hatsumi school, Hatsumi's curriculum, Hatsumi's approach. Interesting, huh? Okay. So what happens when we just listen to other people and we don't do our fucking research. We're trained to be ninja, but we can't get the basic premise of a ninja right from the beginning. Information gathering. Validating information so people can't blow smoke up our ass. Interesting. So when people look at me and go, we don't do ninjutsu. We do budo taijutsu. You do what you want. Obviously, you're doing budo taijutsu. Okay? All of my... my, my uh, the general program in my school, right? And we call it our mastery leadership program, right? Uh, these people do Budo Taijutsu. And they're introduced to Ninjutsu and Ninpo concepts. Those who are in my Shinobi Kai, right? Shinobi group, Shinobi organization. My long distance students have no choice. That's what you're in, right? Their training is different. And not just because we hit harder, throw harder, um, you know, cover topics that would make most people go, oh, that, 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 that contradicts my, my religious upbringing, my political views. I don't give a shit. Okay. You either want to know truth or you don't. You either want to be able to operate free from manipulation and crap and all that. If you do, then you'd better study these things. I'm not telling you you need to take a side. Okay. Anyway. All right. I will get off my my uh, what podium tree stump soapbox whatever right any any other comments come in? Um, Eric Waste asks a question when talking about natural movement in your own style. Does this also come from physical impairment? Yes, of course. It's your body. However, what has to happen though? I mean, you, you can only use what you have. And at any level of training, right? I've, I've got people uh, in the dojo ranging from all kinds of ages, right? My oldest student, uh, Richard, um, he's, he's up there in years now. Richard's 74-ish, give or take, right? Um, started training with me when he was 49. When he was 49, he had a couple of accidents and had like uh, some back injuries, had steel rods in his legs, uh, that kind of stuff, right? So he had certain impairments then. At a certain point, I think the rods were removed, I think. Um, but now, because of age, right? And a couple of other accidents, because he was a farmer and logger and all kinds of stuff, right? Actually had a steer, like a cow steer that he was loading on to train cars and all that kind of stuff. Slip, its hooves go out from under him, and came down and crashed into his body and pinned him up against the side uh, of, the, of the train car, right? So um, Richard can't do this kind of stuff. Richard has to operate with those shoulders barely moving because the range of motion sucks. So at a certain point in Richard's training, 
it didn't matter if we were doing Colto to you, Kukushindo to you, whatever. Richard always got a modification from me where we, we were doing Togakure Kamai because Togakure Kamai fit his body. Right? But what I was taught early on was you need to learn your limitations. Not so that you can make an excuse out of them. Not so that you can become a crutch. You hit your limitations and then you keep working to find where the real limitation is, not the self-assumed or the secondary whatever, right? Somebody, doctor, whatever, told you what your limitations were, okay? For instance, a little over two years ago, just before Christmas, December of, shit, when that was that? It, was, it had to be before COVID, wasn't it? Yeah, because we were wearing masks in the hospital. So Christmas of 2019, I slipped on ice on my back porch, which is just some concrete steps, okay? Body instinctively went into, into a tachi nagare, right? A uh, uh, sitting break fall, right? Except that the corner of the steps, concrete, right? So I saved my brain bucket, saved most of my body, except the lower part of my spine hit that chisel-like piece and broke one of the transverse processes off, okay? And I boo-booed my finger. But anyway, right, so I ended up going to the hospital, right, send me, uh, the, the first thing was uh, I had a choice, right, because uh, I had to go to a rehab uh, center to, because I, could, I couldn't move my legs, I, you know, whatever, right? It was... It was not happy, right? It was not a good place, right? But anyway, uh, you want to go to a standard rehab place, basically a nursing home, rehab center, whatever, right? Or we have this acute rehab center where you will get three to five hours of PT, physical therapy, occupational therapy, all that kind of stuff a day. Um, the difference is this one, they're going to push you and it's going to hurt. This one over here, not hurt so much. I mean, pain's pain, but not hurt so much. And it's going to take longer. Took me 2.2 seconds. Well, I'm going to acute rehab, of course, right? I'm going to the one, I keep moving my fingers around here, but I'm going to the one where they're going to push me, right? Because I need to know what my limitations are right now, right? And I need to speed up this process, okay? Well, that's all great, right? So I get there and the doctors are like, oh, man. So your x-rays and everything, this is going to take a while. Um, so we're, we're talking, what, it's a week and a half out from Christmas, okay? And they're, they're talking, you know, um, definitely not getting you home by Christmas. Your birthday's the beginning of January, probably not then. We're, we're shooting for like the middle to end of January. And I said, yeah, no, I'll be out here in a week, week and a half. Well, you know, we can't promise you'll be home for Christmas. This has nothing to do with Christmas, right? I get shit to do right? This will impair my ability to produce goals, right? I, you know, I'm going to have to work from here, whatever, right? So it has nothing to do with that. But I promise you, if you do your job and I fix my sights on a week to a week and a half, we will both know within the next couple of days, which one of us has the more correct uh, or more realistic uh, view, I had to leave eight days later because insurance wouldn't pay anymore because I was well past where I needed to be, right? Because I didn't accept what they were telling me. Because as soon as you accept that, that adjusts what? Your perspective and viewpoint, okay? We all have limitations because we're human, but 95 to 98% of people are nowhere close to their potential, let alone their lazy plus a little bit uh, ability to function, okay? We, so part of this is understanding limitations, right? What are they? Ultimately, you will find that, look, I can only go this far, body range of motion. I can only, and I know, you, you'll know when you hit some of these, right? Okay, I know that there's a certain limitation to how far you can take this thumb, because if you're really doing junintaiso and flexing and all that, right? You will do certain types of joint manipulations that you do to your shoulders and elbows and all that, but you'll even take it down to the joints in your fingers, right? Hyperflexion, hyperextension, 
right? Rotations, right? Those kind of things, right? And you'll do these, same thing, thumb joint and all that, okay? So I was working the thumbs, okay? And it was very flexible. They were, they were very, very flexible, okay? Until I hit the limitation of the joint itself, that if you go past a certain point, you create weakness, not strength. Do you know how I know that? That day, I was flexing my thumb and touch this side of it to the back of my hand. That wasn't supposed to happen because for the next six weeks, I had to immobilize this joint so it would heal because I went, I found the limitation of the joint with regards to flexibility. This is not a bit, well, it was about pushing myself, right? But I now know what the limitation on the thumb joint is. I know the angle, okay? That's not just for me. I know when I can take somebody to a certain point, they may be stiff and that may hurt and it may stretch and it may cause a strain or a sprain, but I'm talking about dislocating that joint, okay? This is not a tough guy thing or whatever. This is, I don't know, maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it's just being too damn stupid um, didn't, you know, I, I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to be that dedicated and I just listened to what my teacher taught. So anyway, um, so yes, I understand physical impairments, right? As we get older, right? I ended up with meds doing things to my body, right? With putting on weight and fighting to get the weight off and that causing diabetes and all that kind of stuff, right? I get that kind of stuff. I get it. Okay but it doesn't become a crutch. It becomes a baseline that we, that we work with. Okay. So absolutely. The cool thing about Ninja two is that you can modify things based on limitations without, uh, this is going to sound like I'm an asshole, but I'm going to do it. And I'm going to say it anyway. Right. Have you seen Martial arts demonstrations where people are doing, I mean, they're, they're handicapped in some way. I've seen guys that are missing, completely missing legs and all that kind of stuff. Right. And they're, they're in their gi and all that kind of stuff. Right. And they're doing these kata, right. But they're moving as though they possess the leg to throw the kick. Right. But what they'll really do is just kind of throw their hip. Right. And then they'll punch and they'll punch. And so what they've done is, made it so the person can do the kata with their body, but the person really can't fight that way. Does that make sense? Instead of taking what the person has and making that work for them, they're still trying to imitate that which was created and passed down by people with two arms, two legs, that kind of thing, right? If you really understand the principles and concepts, you can teach this stuff to almost anybody. I've taught people in wheelchairs, but we had to we had to use the wheelchair, right? And the way they're going to move in hira or using a hira type movement or this this turning evasion kind of thing in a wheelchair is going to be different than the way you and I move. I know that because the way you and I move is all legs. They're going to have to steer the wheelchair with their hands and arms. They don't get to cheat. Okay? I taught a guy with spina bifida. You know what that is? It's a hole in the in the flesh to the spine, all the way into the spinal cord. So he had nothing from that point down. So he wore these shoes that each had different size lifts on them so that he they could evenly touch the ground because he was born with multiple birth defects, right? One shorter leg, one longer leg but banded them together and then had these crutches that had to like ring on the, on the forearm kind of thing. Right. And so he was a three legged person. He had two crutches and both legs swinging through and that's how he moved around. Right. So everything that I did with him, whether it was, you know, what were supposed to be kicks or punches or whatever, basically turned into Hanbo and Jojutsu because these crutches, unless he was in bed sleeping, were just, they were, a, they were a part of his body. And the fact that he had, you know, three points of contact or two points as we're getting out of the way and all that, that's what we had to work with, okay? Right? That's working with limitations that we can't do anything about. There's no pushing him past. What I had to do in the first couple of classes with him was understand how 
he moved and then give him some other things to see if that was possible. And if it was, how do we employ the crutches to create that, that stability so that he could move his body to that new position and do it quickly, right? Strike those kind of things, right? So there was going to be no kicking with the legs, but the crutches could be used like a kick, right? Same thing with striking. He can let go of the handles. They're attached to the forearms. So he can strike this way, grab the handle and moved it. But we created something that was natural for him based on the same principles and concepts. But you have to understand the principles and concepts before you can do something like that. Otherwise, what you do is what a bunch of these other yahoos are doing is, well, ninjas, there are lots of different uh, types of ninjutsu. So what they do is they run around and make up their own shit so they can be the leader of their own ninja clan. Anyway, James, you haven't seen anybody like this running around. <laughs> You're on my way more than I am. I'm on time for all that shit. Right? I'm, I'm too busy with with uh, helping new students uh, onboard in the training or uh, coming up with programs that will really help people um, get the real thing, and you know, whatever. So anyway, any other questions or comments? Hopefully that was helpful. I apologize if I, if I uh, went down a dark, dusty back road, but anyway. No, nothing else. Okay. All right, so still have a couple minutes. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump on this little thing here. Uh, again, not naming names or anything because, you know, uh, th this is not about who it is, right? But I'm going to go down through this thread here just a little bit so that I can reinforce a point, uh, multiple points actually, right? Because this doesn't just point to answers to questions. It points to how we answer questions, okay? Because if I don't know where they are in their head, about whether it's a question they're asking or something they're, they're trying to uh, get their head wrapped around or me trying to convey a lesson. If I don't understand the processor, I can't communicate very well. Okay. So there's that. There's something in here about come I. There's something in here about speed, all that kind of stuff. Right. So I'm just going to kind of go down through here and then we'll see if anybody has any questions or whatever. But I'm, I'm going to very, very quickly and I'll summarize things. So it's not this. Uh, big old thing because some of the comments and back and forth was uh, a little bit long. But anyway, um, so again, he's a martial artist from India. Uh, he's watched my videos YouTube uh, on YouTube, read my articles, uh, that kind of thing, right? Um, as a matter of fact, most of my serious students uh, have come to me after binge listening to Kuden at the Wazoo and finding at least some of the 600 articles I have circulating around the internet. Um, so anyway, right? So um uh, I just said, thank you for your kind words. Hope you found value in my articles and videos. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, your martial arts background, right? T typical conversations I have with people, right? So uh, again, he's from India, um, uh, done Taekwondo, Kung Fu. I don't know uh, which one specifically, uh, and a bit of Wushu. Uh, there's like between Northern style and Southern style Kung Fu, right? One's more internal, one's more external, Um my research has shown that there's upwards of 81,000 different styles of Kung Fu. That's just a couple, right? So great. Uh, as a matter of fact, our, our uh, Nimpo Taijutsu uh, is similar to certain forms of Kung Fu, uh, like uh, Chin Na and uh, a couple like that. But anyway, um, so yes, definitely your videos and articles have been helpful. Um, uh, he actually went into, cause I, I say sir a lot and, and call people by their, their first names or not first names, last names and, and things like that. Uh, not just because of martial arts, but because of things I've learned about how students treat their teacher or they do the same thing kids do, right? You go to first name basis and all that. And what they'll very quickly do is either elevate themselves to the, uh, to the seniors level or lower the senior to their level. So now you're on a peer to peer kind of thing. And that's, that leaves the door open for people to start like cheating on the standards. Right. Well, like th this one really bothers me and stuff like that. Do I, do I have to do that to get my rank? Uh, yeah. Let me show you a couple of modifications for that because you don't know when you're going to end up in a situation like that. And for me to cripple you by going, yeah, it's okay, Bubba, don't worry about it. 
you know, you can slide on that one, right? Um, not doing you or the world any good. Anyway, uh, so he, he actually um, uh, told me not to call him sir since I'm the senior martial artist. Uh, so anyway, I, I thank you for his background. Uh, how old are you? How long you've been training? What ranks, if any, that kind of thing. Also, just so you know, as my teacher, Grandmaster Hatsumi, has done with me and his teacher, Grandmaster Takamatsu, did with him, I tend to use respectful terms like sir towards students, like using san at the end of someone's name in Japanese. Uh, even sometimes using the term sensei to acknowledge someone's potential for mastery. Shrey Sensei has, uh, has called has called students sensei all the time. Hatsumi Sensei has done that, right? And he even he's written about it, right? Not my fault people can't or won't read. Um, uh, that it acknowledges someone's potential, right? Takamatsu Sensei called him sensei when he was still kohai, when he's still junior, right? Uh, so I appreciate your concern because of the way things can be translated or even mistranslated outside of Japan and our lineages, but any dis discomfort should be recognized and seen for what it is. Okay. It's an egocentric thing and it's not mine. Okay. Uh, let's see. So it gave me more background on him, uh, you know, um, belt levels, that kind of stuff. Right. So, uh, made a comment about sensei, uh, Hazumi sensei moves effortlessly, a genuine master, um, I did not go into the fact that Hatsumi Sensei is now retired and almost exclusively wheelchair bound. So, um, you know, but the role model is still there, right? So, um, do, 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 ask him if he knew about Kuden and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, then, so here's this question, right? Is Hatsumi Sensei's needed to a mobile art or a stable one, right? I don't like to make assumptions, so I clarified that a little bit. Um, but it did turn out that my assumption was right. He was talking about, you know, is a stationary stance kind of thing, or are we, you know, moving around that kind of thing, right? But this is important for everybody to get because th there's all these, these questions about hard style, soft style, stable, moving, all these, all these, it, this dichotomy, right? Is it this or is it this? Because people are just dying. Ego dies to just pigeonhole things. Because if I can pigeonhole it, Two things happen, minimum. One, it's easy now. I've got a quick answer. And two, I can short customer cut the rest of the system because, right, it's just this one thing. Okay. So uh, when he asked about the mobile art or stable one, I said, which part of the art are you asking about? There are nine lineages he holds Soke ship to, not counting the countless others integrated that he received complete transmission to. If we're only discussing the armed and unarmed fighting system, that's one thing. If we're looking at the full scope of all of Ninpo, that may be something else. As a quick answer regarding the fighting system, a ninja always stays in motion to keep the opponent always in the wrong place and trying to get at him physically, mentally, and emotionally. Uh, da -da -da -da. I'll send links. Da -da 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 -da. Um, again, he asks if it's stable, right? Um, so I said, what do you mean by stable? And so, you know, he did say that, so by stable, I mean, lack of movement and art like karate is stable. Hatsumi sensei hardly moves yet. He defeats his opponents An app word I would think will be static. Okay. So, um, so what I said was, that's what I thought. The answer is both. Okay. Everything is contextual and one needs options to survive. Okay. Um, so what I mean by that is like Hatsumi said, say upper level people are processing way more than what the, what a lower level student or just the everyday person is, 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 is processing, right? We're processing things that most people don't even know exist, let alone that you can use it right in a fight. So if I've already, before the punch or kick or whatever is thrown, if I've already um, uh, created a certain distance, presented my body a certain way so that he goes after certain targets at a certain angle, those kind of things, right? I don't have to move as much, okay? If I note the guy throws, you know, right, right crosses and whatnot, right? I don't have to move nearly as much. I can drop below the punch and end up outside his body because he's going to miss and go over the top, Right? So, but in the beginning, you have to, you have to learn the big movements, right? Everybody wants to shortcut the surface, uh, the, the process 
and move like Hatsumi Sensei in Shizen, little movement, no movement at all, whatever, right? Except that they they forget that for decades, he started out big and then systematically dropped what was not necessary as he understood more about timing, distancing, angling, flow, those kind of things, right? To get to where everybody sees, I've always seen what he was doing as that's my model, right? That's my Picasso. That's my role model. I want to get to that point. How, what, what am I missing? What, what training did he do that I need to do to get there? I'm not going to be some delusional fantasy laden uh, wannabe or whatever who just, you know, I'm, I'm going to ignore the fact that Hatsumi Sensei started out where I'm starting out, right? And had to, you know. So anyway, um, then he jumps to, uh, I will I like the Kamai of Nijutsu? How would you have answered that? I bet most people would go, yes, of course, right? Because you have confirmation bias, right? Um, so he says, uh, well, I like the Kamai of Nijutsu because the arts I practiced are having conventional footwork. Will I like the footwork of Nijutsu? Will I like Tai Sabaki? Here's my short answer, and I'll get to how I answered things for him, right? This has nothing to do with liking or disliking, right? Most people translate Tai Sabaki as evasion. I just did a whiteboard Wednesday on this. Did, what, did I just do that a week or two ago? Yeah. Okay. So Tai Sabaki, right? doesn't mean evasion. Tai Sabaki means body management, right? And if you slightly change the, the, the kanji for Sabaki, it means um, body judgment. So yes, you're evading. It's kind of like the Budo Taijutsu, Nippo Taijutsu thing at the beginning. Yes, you're evading, right? But you're evading in a way that you open up all of his targets, close off all of yours. He can't get at you, but you can get at him. That's Tai Sabaki. That's easier said than done. But that's the skill set, right? It's not just, well, you move at a 45 degree angle. No, you don't. 45 degrees, 30 degrees, whatever, is an expedient that a teacher gives in the beginning to give somebody a reference point that holds that long. Until you don't need it anymore because you understand that you are angled to the attack while maintaining profiled or cover against his body. So, yes, you're evading the attack, but you're moving to a very specific place. What's that place, Sensei? That place is that place based on his movement right now. Not the same place you always move to because that was the shortcut and the easy thing. All right. So again, he keeps asking, right? Um, uh, will I like it? Will I, you know, whatever. Okay. So uh, what I say is with all honesty, I would never presuppose what you would like. For me, coming from other martial arts before Ninja 2, I can say that the Kamai felt strange. But to me, it was never a case of like or dislike. I had a goal of self-protection, not style. Okay. Again, you listen to episode 68. That has my backstory and stuff in it, right? Um, for my, let's say, da, da, da. again, for me, the Kamai, let's see, I had the martial arts and self-defense strategies that I did. Da, 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 da. Anyway, again, for me, the Kamai made sense from a natural human response perspective rather than a conformity perspective. Might they feel odd, strange, or different in the beginning? Yes. Will you like them? I cannot say. Why are you training in the martial arts and what is your ultimate goal from all this? Okay. So he said he's training for self-defense. Uh, I watched a lot of videos on Nijutsu. It is a very intelligently designed art. And if they claim that Nijutsu is the best martial art, I have no arguments to refute them. Uh, even though I don't like the weapon, but still will I dedicate myself to learning it because it's definitely one of the best, if not the best, question mark. Um, my answer was I believe it's the best that I found for self-defense. Uh, and this, again, you have to know, understand my litmus test. This is not about just fighting because I could swap out the Taijutsu with Krav Maga. That's very, very similar. I could swap it out with, again, Chin Na and some other things that are very, very similar. What I can't swap out is mindset. I can't swap out all the other aspects that make Ninjutsu what it is that have nothing to do with combat. I can't swap it out for with one system when I'd be surrendering nine, right, approaches to the same uh, – the, so again, it's, it's, it's a different thing. Right. But anyway, um, I, uh, I believe it's the best that I found for self-defense. Again, this is for me, right? Mostly because it gives one many more options 
which is why people keep running around trying to combine different martial arts to make up for things each one is missing. Okay. Uh, he says, I agree. Ninjutsu has everything meant to be in a martial arts arsenal. I think it has stuff that people need for success in, in any area of their life, not just martial arts. As long as we keep focusing on martial arts, martial arts, combat, self defense, that kind of self defense, right? Duck and punches, blades, bullets, whatever, right? Which is important, but as long as we focus on that, it's a trap. We're only doing at best 30% of the entire art. I would say closer to 10, but anyway, right? Because where do Kuji fit if you're only doing Nimpo or Budo Tajitsu? Where's the Goshimbo psychological self defense fit? Right? Where do the go, uh, Godai Nodin fit? Which is really helpful in like anxiety management and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, let's see. He says, Come on, I feel strange to me too, but if my aim is to learn the best martial art, I think I would like it. Uh, the Kamai might be strange, but I assume they are as fast. And here we go that they're as fast as postures of any other martial art. And then I assume ninjutsu is as fast as any other art. Okay. So my answer is yes, they are very fast. My original answer was that based on my training in other arts, they felt strange in the beginning. They no longer feel that way. As a matter of fact, they're actually more natural for the human body than the stances of other arts and systems that I practiced. Okay. Um, again, he kept going back to fast. That's going to take a whole other thing. Maybe I'll make that a whiteboard Wednesday or whatever. Or did I? Did I do something on speed, James? Speed is based on timing, distancing, angling, um, those kind of things, catching him uh, in mid-movement and all that. It's not – speed in ninjutsu is not based on how fast you're contracting muscles and moving body parts. It's based on timing. Right? Did I, did I do a whiteboard Wednesday on that? On timing, Yes. Three different types of timing. Right. That I require for my need on students, but that I, did I cover timing as a speed issue or was it maybe just a part of that one? When it touched on it, I don't think there was one that you really hit on it a whole lot. Yeah. Cause the thing, the thing within need to and the thing that was really pushed when I was a white belt was we're going to get slower as we get older, right? Chuck Norris to maintain speed has to work out four or five times harder and longer than guys in their twenties. It's just the nature of the beast. Right. So, but why would we, okay. The things that we're focusing on timing, distancing, angling, uh, those kind of things, right. Get better with age while muscles atrophy, the body slows down. It's just the nature of the beast. Right. So if I'm going to, if I'm going to um, defend myself against a 20 something, I'm not fighting like a 20 something. I'm not going to be focusing on conventional speed and all that kind of stuff. I know that rubs egos the wrong way, but hopefully your mind will change as you get older and realize that you really will become that kind of person that you're telling yourself right now. Well, I'll never let my body get like that. I'll ne really, well, I'm glad you're, you're such an ESP uh, fortune teller kind of thing, right? Because if you were already that good at that, why the hell are you taking a martial art? If you can already see into the future, won't you be able to know that you're going to be jumped by three thugs at the corner of Fourth and Elm at 645 on, you know, Wednesday, June 14th of whatever year June 14th happens to be a Wednesday, right? Wouldn't you fucking already know that? Then you could just go, well, shit, I'm going to be anywhere else but Fourth and Elm Street at whatever time, because that will completely avoid it. It's, it's ironic to me that people presume to know, right? And their training reflects it. Presume to know how and what and where and whatever they're going to need when some jack wagon comes out of, a, out of the darkness and tries to beat, break, maim, kill them, whatever, right? They presume to know what they're going to need but they can't get the other shit in their life together because they didn't see that stuff coming. Maybe they can only see assassins. Maybe that's what it is. Okay. Just a bunch of bullshit. There's just ego games, right? One part of this art is get over yourself. Okay. 
to understand natural movement, to understand Nijitsu and what nature and universal justice and all that kind of stuff means within this art, means I understand what ego can do. So I need to get control of ego. I understand the, the nature of aging and, and all those kind of things. I understand that there are different types of personality types, learning types, uh, communication types, all that kind of stuff. So that makes me study those things so I can better um, communicate with people and not cause conflict that comes up in and manifest that way, right? There's all kinds of things, right? Right. Um, one of the first things I learned as a white belt after learning how to do Ichimonji no Kamae and Ichimonji no Kata was, um, oh, by the way, there's a psychological form to that Kata. There's an emotional form to that Kata, right? Somebody's yelling and screaming at you and everything, right? You don't take up Kamae and then pow. I mean, you could, but you're going to jail, right? Um, or going to the morgue when their family comes after you, right? Um, but what's the essential nature? What are the principles and concepts that make that physical model what it is? Now, take those same principles and concepts and apply that in an argument. Apply that against the pushy salesman. A apply that when the, po when the politician is promising you rainbow farts and sprinkles, right? To make all your problems go away without you having to freaking do any work, right? Uh, use that against uh, the social engineering machine that's trying to convince you that uh, the emperor really is wearing clothes. All that kind of crap, right? So eventually the physical models, the techniques that everybody's, oh, just freaking vibrating in their underwear all about, right? Become models for, for controlling business negotiations, parenting, uh, you know, uh, working within the marriage, uh, being more successful in life, asking for that raise at work, all that kind of stuff. I mean, just, you know, I mean, actually realizing that you are worth what you dream to be worth and you're willing to face the blade that happens to be ridicule, or the, as one of my teachers used to say, the dragons of ignorance, deceit, and um, whatever, manipulation, that kind of crap, right? Um, and you're willing to face the blade by going into their office and going, look, dude, this is not cutting it, right? I'm not tolerating this kind of stuff, right? And, or applying for jobs or positions or going after the girl or whatever that, that you, know, you believe, because everybody's told you, right? You believe uh, is out of your league. Well, how the hell will you know unless you push against your limitations? Because after you're the, after you're past the age of eighteen or twenty one, whatever legal happens to be wherever you live, right? No matter what anybody else told you, right? The blame game stops because it's personal responsibility. It's the foundation of our ninpo. It's the foundation of our mikyo. Personal responsibility, right? Up until a certain point, I can go well. The powers that be are holding me down because you know unless I run away from home or you know whatever, right? Um, I'll get in trouble. Da, 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 da. Okay. After a certain age, doesn't matter what they tell you. Okay. It's up to you to test it, to make sure that you know what they taught you, which was right, which was wrong, what was bullshit, what they didn't know what they were talking about. They were just passing on shit, whatever. Right. You've tested all these other things, right. And you're producing your own results. That's also needs to. Okay? There are many different forms of needs to. N not the, bullshit that people keep throwing together, right? It's in how they're being used, right? But ultimately the same, same goal. Anyway, um, so again, speed in need to, again, the, the question kept, keeps coming and I invited him to be on Kuda. So I, I hope that he actually did listen in because this is just a whole lot easier than typing out a whole bunch of freaking words, right? Um, we don't, we don't look at, we don't look at speed, strength, power, any of those things, the way conventional martial arts do. So this is not even comparing apples to oranges or dates to mangoes or whatever. It's not. It's, it's, it's not the same. It's not the same. Because if it were the same, the smaller person's going to lose. The older person's going to lose. Right? The sick or infirm are going to lose. We need to be adaptable. We need to be able to change as the conditions change and we need to be able to operate contextually, right? The answer to punching faster is to walk my weapon 
as close to his target as possible before I launch it, instead of trying to stand way back here and cross that big void fast enough that I can catch him before he moves. How about if I just hit him while I'm busy avoiding the thing he's trying to throw so he's busy missing and instead of trying to cross a space that big, right? I'm, for those of you on audio, I'm showing two and a half, three feet, give or take, right? Instead of trying to cross that and use tricky little things like jabs and, and whatnot, right? Um, how about if as he's punching or kicking, I shift and while he's missing and his target comes within four to six inches of me, right? I learn how to generate a butt ton of power, right? In four to six inches, right? You know, Bruce Lee had a one inch punch. We have a no inch punch, right? But it has nothing to do with inches from the skin. It has to do with the organ I'm trying to hit or the spinal column. That doesn't mean I'm going to punch through his flesh. That just means my perspective is different. It's not what it looks like. If you're always operating on being the fastest and you get an illness that slows you down, you better hope to God or whatever you ascribe to that you're never attacked on that day. Because all the shit that you practiced and, and, and held sacred will be useless that day. We should be getting better as we get older and slower because it's about wisdom, not about tricky, smart trick, whatever, right? All right, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, any other questions or comments that came in? No, sir. No? So I've either lulled people to sleep or I've mesmerized them or um, they weren't really listening anyway. So, okay. Okay. Um, Again, if you're in the States or in one of the uh, related Western countries and all that, where we have a Memorial Day uh, for our fallen uh, military uh, uh, folks and whatnot, or Remembrance Day or whatever you happen to call it where you are, um, again, don't forget, don't forget the day, right? Or don't forget what it's all about, because even within our own martial systems, right, for this to make it this far without it being a sport martial art or a contest, right? Remember that the contests were like for life, right? So never, ever forget that people lived and died over the past several hundred years, 2000 for needs to, um, lived and died to pass this on so that we could train. So even if you're not all about the military because you don't like the the, the military uh, warfare complex or the government control or uh, military people are pawns and, and it's sad that that I don't give a shit. I don't care what you're I, I don't care. Right. Switch it to your martial stuff. That way now it's timeless and it crosses country boundaries and all that kind of stuff. People lived and died for us to learn this stuff correctly. Don't dishonor their their memory. Or effort. Okay. All right. I saw something else pop through. Was that a question or a comment or? <clears throat> uh, just a comment. Okay. Uh, from Old Wage Training, thank you so much for your time and effort in helping me grow. Domo arigato. And you often give so much to think about. I usually have to go away and contemplate what you say. Well, that's what I do when I go to Japan too. So why should you be any different, right? I go for two weeks, train like 40 hours in two weeks, fill up at least one, if not two notebooks and come home and spend the rest of the next six months to a year trying to sort out all the stuff that like, uh, that actually got in and got on the paper. Uh, and then later on the little things will pop up, but it's, it's the same. It's the process, right? Kuden teacher to student transmission, void transmission, right? This is not about techniques. It's not, not about techniques, right? But it's about all the stuff that say, everybody wants to learn the stuff on the den show, which is the moves, right? What about the stuff on the makimono where the real power of the lineage exists? What about that? Without that, the densho techniques mean nothing because you don't know that you're practicing them the way the art is. And I know, I mean, I, I trust the master teachers. I trust the Tsumi sensei, all that kind of stuff. Right. Okay. But even I was in a class with Nagato sensei one time and he said, you know, we're doing this kata, right? This is the way I do it. Right. But 
Seno Sensei has his way to do it. So Maya Sensei has his way of doing it, right? Um, and Hatsumi Sensei has never said anything about these differences, which makes me believe that it's that it's okay because these are just little one-liners, right? The trick is to get past the form to the essential nature of the technique, the kotsu. Same thing, the essential nature of the art. But if we're only ever focusing on the monkey moves, well, shit. How many of those can you learn before you think you become a master? You want to become a master? Control somebody who wants to beat, break, and kill you to the extent where they never attack. Because they no longer see you as a threat or a viable target or whatever. Okay? So you know what, James, make a little note. Um, there is a three-phase uh, transition, so it's kind of a transcendence kind of thing. Uh, in the art to go from the ideal, right? Where you set up your life in a way that nobody ever thinks about attacking you all the way down to base level stuff for beginners, which is the actual physical combat moves. There's three levels, three phases in needs through training. And the ultimate is you become literally invisible and i don't mean and you disappear right you are invisible in the eyes of the the opponent or the attacker they they never they never think of attacking you okay that is what takes decades to master right so we start people off in the part that well you don't have that handled and you don't even have the second phase handled so we got to start you off where you're most likely to find yourself which is since you couldn't prevent it, now you need to survive it. So let's make that a topic um, for an upcoming Kuden. How about that? But speaking of which, uh, so you know what? Uh, people can write in and, and let me know. The next week's topic is supposed to be um, how I handle haters, right? Because <laughs> heaven, heaven knows there's enough things out there, right? Because um, I'm just the old fat bald guy who doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, and that's okay, right? You just keep you just keep thinking that it's all cool. I'm all good with that, right? Or we could do that three phase thing on these different phases of our training, which has to do with life and ability and, and those kind of things, right? So um, whatever anybody wants me to do next week, I'll be the dancing monkey. So that that's those are your two topics to choose from, right? Either how to deal with haters, right? Which I know. We all have to deal with, whether it's in the art or whatever, right? How to deal with those kind of people that have made it their um, their mission in life overtly or maybe even subconsciously because they're just hardwired as a dick um, to, to derail you from your success, right? Or we can do those three phases that I just mentioned, okay? Either way works. I'm good, right? Because I'll just bump the if, – if we're doing the one, I'll bump the other to the next uh, week. Either way works. Okay. So, yeah, we good? All right. All right. Sure. So that's it. Um, th these things are turning out to be like two-hour shows and stuff like that. And I think most podcasts are like an hour. So maybe I give you guys too much. What do you think? Well, tough, right? If if you got to go to Nappy Nap or you end up hating me and decide that I'm not your cup of tea, that's okay. Because you know what? Part of my job as a teacher is to cause students, not to disqualify students. I don't disqualify anybody. But I do do things in a certain way that cause students, potential students, to disqualify themselves. Okay, because I'm not changing things because of somebody's discomfort level. Right, need to persevering, enduring, overcoming hardship, overcoming challenges, and sometimes the biggest freaking challenge we have to overcome is ourselves. So. I'm not watering it down. Okay. I will parse out the lessons in a way that make it easy for people to, to get it, but I'm not removing certain things because people feel uncomfortable. And if that's what disqualifies themselves, there's plenty of other teachers out there that will, that will let you dictate the curriculum. It's the nature of the world today, right? Students have hijacked universities. Why not students hijacking martial arts? And it's easy, right? Just like people, when, as soon as the minister tells us, tells some, or gives a lesson in, in church that people don't like, what do they do? They go find another church. Or if they have the power, they fire the minister, 
get somebody in there that'll tell them what they want to hear. Okay. So if you don't think that's happening within the martial arts, there's plenty of people running around. There's plenty of teachers who need students. They need disciples. They need, they need that ego rush, right? Good teachers don't need that. Good mentors don't need that. Okay. And you should keep that in mind for the people that you mentor in your life as well. Right. Don't go begging and groveling. You're worth more than that. Right. That's it. All right, James, anything else? Uh, Terrence just said his vote was for the three phases. Okay. That's one. <laughs> okay. All right. We're going to wrap this up. I'll talk to everybody again next time. Be safe. Have a good week. I've got uh, my week's full. I've got a, a, a kid. Uh, we got a, par a graduation party. He's going off to the Air Force on Monday. Next Monday, not today. Next Monday. Um, we've got a, a kids camp starting. I've got a, a whole new program, six-week program for uh, uh, for a certain type of group coming into the school, uh, all kinds of stuff. So anyway, but that doesn't mean that we won't read emails and all that. If I don't get to it, James will, whatever. If you have any questions, comments, or you want to put your vote in for one of those two topics, you can send it to warriorc at warrior-concepts-online.com. Uh, don't forget, like and subscribe to the channel if you're on YouTube. Uh, on Facebook, obviously, you can like things and whatnot. Share this stuff around. If you know people that uh, you know could benefit from it, whether they'll like it or not, doesn't matter, right? Let them decide, right? Uh, share the stuff out and whatnot. Help get the word out, uh, and, and we'll go from there. I'm also producing more content uh, for YouTube. Uh, if you didn't see the wrist grab, uh, the latest wrist grab uh, video, uh, some stuff that we teach uh, Mod 1 people. Uh, uh, check that out, right? That's over on uh, the Kage 36 uh, page. Is there a link to that, to our YouTube page on Online Ninja Academy? Yes. Okay. Well, just go there then and then hop over to get to the right place. Uh, so if there's topics you want me to cover or techniques or something for Whiteboard Wednesday, which is really a high level strategy and tactics kind of thing, get that stuff in as well. Right. Uh, instead of me trying to figure out what people might be interested in. How about if you just tell me and then uh, that'll just make it easier on both of us. Right. And don't worry about whether or not anybody else is sending it in. Right. Most don't. So I'll tell you the same thing that my teachers told me. Okay. Yoko buddy, be greedy. Okay. You got one life. Uh, each, uh, Ichigo Ichie, right. Ichigo Ichie. We just covered that in a, in a recent lesson. Ichigo Ichie. Right. Japanese uh, saying Ichigo Ichie. Right. One life, one chance. Don't waste it. Stop waiting. I'll talk to you next time. Get more of Kudan Radio. Subscribe to your favorite podcasting site or subscribe at ModernNinjaWarrior.com.